Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining this webinar. Um, we're going to wait just a couple of minutes uh, to let people join in. So feel free to grab a cup of coffee, tea, or some other drinks. We're going to wait just one more minute. There are still people coming in. Okay, yeah, are we ready? I guess we are. So hello everyone again. Um, I am Sergio Russo, one of the editors of the 36.1 ARC volume on resilience and archeology. span uh, Together with Leah Brainerd, co-editor of the volume and Victoria Pham, uh, our book reviews editor. Uh, we would like to welcome you to this launch event. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, the Archaeological Review from Cambridge is a biannual journal of archaeology, uh, which is run on a non-profit voluntary basis by researchers at the University of Cambridge. The ARC publications have played an important role in promoting academic discourse on methods and theory in archaeology, being always ahead of its time and proposing topics that would have later become fashionable within the discipline. But one most important thing, um, it has been doing so for a very long time. Um, so we are very happy and excited to celebrate our 40th anniversary this year. And let me tell you, um, it's not easy for a student-led journal to survive for such a long time. 
um, running a journal, as many uh, of you might know, um, is not easy per se. Um, and this becomes more challenging um, when the editorial board uh, changes every couple of years. And I don't even want to mention the pandemic. I think we have already heard enough. Um, but we are doc doctoral and master students, and we are here for a very short time. And keeping this machine well oiled um, requires a strong dedication and commitment. So first of all, we, have, we would like to thank all those students um, who have been contributing to the success, as well as our subscribers for their constant uh, support. In a way, uh, the present volume wishes to pay homage to all of you and to the resilience of this journal. So really, thank you. And now coming to, uh, to resilience, um, when we first approached the subject, we were confused. Um, we were not aware of what we would have found that basically it's a Pandora's uh, box. As defined by uh, Susan Moser and colleagues, the resilience world is a rather turbulent one in which different definitions, uh, different disciplines, different perspectives and different themes exist. Is resilience a strategy to overcome disturbances? Is it a property that describes the strength of a system? Is it individually or socially situated? And most importantly, can we even explore past resilience? These and other questions highlight one key fact, um, that diversity is the main pillar of resilience studies. Now we could have approached this diversity in three different ways, um, by ignoring it, uh, thus focusing only on archeological research, by acknowledging it, or by exploring it in the attempt to find uh, an order within such a world. Of course, now I'm not gonna give you more details. Um, as you know, we need to keep a bit of a suspense to, so that you might wish to buy the volume. Uh, but for now, let me tell you that some answers can be found in the volume. And without further ado, I'm going to leave the mic uh, to Leah, um, the other uh, editor of the volume, who will explain to you how this launch event will work and all the um, IT um, stuff. So thank you again for coming, for joining in, and I hope you enjoyed this, um, this series of uh, talks. No, thank you, Sergio. Um, as a nonprofit student-led journal, it's been extremely challenging to produce this volume in the time of this pandemic. Um, thus, we would like to end this sort of short introduction and move on to our wonderful speakers by thanking numerous people who've been involved in making this volume into a reality. First and foremost, our contributors, for without them, there would be no volume to share with you today. The anonymous reviewers who, in a year of strife and exponentially growing reviewer requests took the time to give their comments to improve papers. Uh, we want to thank all the members of the ARC and several professionals at the Department of Archaeology and the McDonald Institute here at Cambridge for their continued assistance in keeping us afloat. Um, we particularly want to thank Glenn Maynard for her comments in the introduction and continuing serving as my personal rock. Um, Benji Messier for uh, turning our mental image into a beautiful piece of cover art. Um, Simone Russo for the cover design and his help formatting the volume. Our speakers today for agreeing to help us celebrate this volume, Professor Charles Redman and uh, Dr. Eric Jesfield. Eric especially has given his support throughout the editing process and comments on the introduction, which we are eternally grateful for. Victoria Pham, editor for our book reviews, who has put an incredible amount of work and time into the book reviews for the volume. We appreciate you. And finally, I would like to thank my co-editor, Sergio, who has been the true captain on this journey, uh, guiding this ship to port, and it wouldn't have been possible without him. So thank you, Sergio. And of course, thank you all for coming. Um, as you can see, this is a Zoom webinar, which means you'll only be able to see the panelists who are going to talk. Um, you will have an opportunity to interact with us. Uh, after the talk, there will be a Q&A session. So if you would like to ask something with your mic and camera on, please raise your virtual hand by using the function at the bottom of your screen and we will allow you to share your question. 
Alternatively, you can type in your question using the Q&A button. If you have any um, experience, any technical difficulties, please use the chat function and we'll try and handle the problem as soon as we can, but we're also not experts, so we'll try. <laughs> Um, this se session will be recorded for archival purposes, but it's not live streamed. The video will be available online on our YouTube channel within the next couple days if you have anyone who hasn't been able to make the event. Um, finally, I'd like to say we are a nonprofit student led journal again. So if you want to support us, we remind you you can purchase a copy of this volume using the link that we'll share in the chat. Um, other volumes are available for purchase through our website or you could support us even better by get, buying it, having a subscription. Um, and then you'll receive all volumes that you get from the ARC, which range in a variety of different topics. So with that out of the way, um, I would like to welcome our first speaker today, who will be introducing our volume, Dr. Eric uh, Jessfield. Eric is a program officer in human sciences at the John Templeton uh, Foundation. Many here at Cambridge know Eric because he was previously a Renfrew Fellow at the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research and a Fellow at Fitzwilliam College. Prior to this, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the Institute for Society and Genetics and a lecturer at, in the Department of Anthropology at UCLA. Eric's research focuses on exploring how humans in the past and present manage challenges associated with social, social and ecological change. His approach uh, emphasizes the use of quantitative methods to evaluate the role of diversity in mitigating uh, environmental risk and building resilience to environmental change. We again want to thank Eric for all his assistance in the volume, including his former footstool, which we have made use of extensively. So please welcome Dr. Eric Jessfield. Uh, thank you very much, Leah, um, for the kind introduction and the good use of the footstool that I left with you in Cambridge. Um, so I will uh, share my screen here. And can everyone see my slides? Yep, great. Um, so once again, thank you for the introduction and inviting me not only to uh, introduce the volume here, but also for sort of including me on this journey you've been on. Um, I think it has been challenging over the last 15 months to put together this volume and just an immense amount of credit to Sergio and Leah for pulling this off and, and seeing this through. Um, you know, the idea of resilience itself um, is perhaps more relevant now than even when we started this discussion, which I believe was pre-pandemic when the sort of first sort of uh, discussions were happening about this. And it's because we've had a sort of, uh, you know, period of a substantial change and probably uh, a lot of reorganization within um, the social culture environment we live. And at least for me, sort of reading through this volume has helped me sort of reassess the sort of concept of resilience. Um, perhaps even redefine what it means both in the application to looking at our own social ecological systems um, and of course those that we study uh, in the past. So you can see a copy of the cover art here, uh, which once again is a, a sort of a, a very nice um, sort of visual representation of what's in the volume. So uh, I want to start today and sort of introducing this volume by actually where Sergio and Leah start at the very beginning of their introduction with a section headed uh, with the title Resilience Once Again. And this sort of phrase uh, implies that we have been down this road before, that we have discussed ideas of resilience before in archeology, span and perhaps even that we still need another conversation about resilience once again. And the truth is, is that resilience is still in some ways a fairly young concept in archeology. span uh, I did a, just a very quick uh, sort of analysis of the term resilience within the topic of archeology span based upon the web of science. And we can see here, we do have a steady increase in the articles that have uh, resilience within sort of the, the title, the keywords and the abstract. Um, but also within then, so the topic of archaeology, we see a steady increase in that through time. 
but still roughly only about uh, you know 35 to 40 articles in the last year had some sort of uh, notion or some sort of mention of resilience uh, in these key terms and titles. That being said, we do see quite a large rise in the citations of resilience articles over that same time period with uh, upwards of 600 citations last year alone to this corpus of uh, resilience articles in archaeology. And so while we may not see the sort of really uh, attraction of primary research looking at resilience concepts, we definitely see perhaps a, a, a substantial interest in the concept and in the topic uh, and an interest in discussing the ideas of resilience. So when I looked at these particular uh, trends, I, I, I asked myself sort of where is resilience as a concept, as a sort of paradigm, as, as a sort of a, a useful notion in archaeology, really in its life cycle. And, and so I borrowed the terminology from what's sometimes known as the hype cycle, which is, is applied in ideas of technology and how technology uh, sort of changes through time. And this sort of idea of, of are we in a, a sort of peak of inflated expectations? Are we in a sort of trough of disillusionment, perhaps a slope of enlightenment? Or or really the, the goal, I think, this sort of plateau of productivity where we have a sort of corpus or a foundation of literature developed in which we can really build off of in a number of different ways. And for each of you, uh, you know, where you might place sort of ideas of resilience in archeology span on this trend or on this model would probably be influenced by how you view the, the utility of ideas of social uh, uh, ecological systems, how you view the utility of resilience theory as formulated in ecology, and how you view the application of uh, a, the adaptive cycle to archaeological research. For me personally, I would probably put myself right around this point. Uh, maybe the optimist in me suggests that we are going to see uh, uh, maybe a period of enlightenment, so to speak, uh, within resilience research in archeology span where we can see it uh, move from its sort of initial phase and in the borrowing from ecology into a uh, sort of contextualized phase within archeological research. I imagine some of you maybe not uh, share this optimism with me. And in fact, the introduction to this volume takes a slightly more uh, pessimistic tone, so to speak, uh, in this sort of perspective. So let me sort of bring, uh, bring around this to the introduction uh, written by uh, Sergio and Leah, in which the authors here uh, highlight this idea of resilience as having a, a dissociative disorder, which I think is a sort of uh, a playful uh, way to describe this, given that resilience also has a substantial amount of um, influence within worlds of psychology as well. And really what we, what we see here, what the argument I think from Sergio and Leah are, is that one of the aspects of resilience that has been most challenging for archaeologists is the sort of ambiguity and vagueness of some of the concepts and they, they suggest that really this is a result of this theoretical translation from uh, disciplines outside of archaeology, from ecology and from psychology, probably most uh, primarily. And I think this is something we've all recognized perhaps as resilience researchers. I, I certainly have had conversations with colleagues that, that have suggested, that have, that have told me, I, I don't use the term resilience because I don't know what it means. Um, and, and so we clearly have a sort of a concern that the sort of what exactly resilience means in archaeology is, is still to be determined. I think one of the more interesting things that Leah and Sergio bring up in this chapter is that this ambiguity can be advantageous at times, in fact, almost, uh, ne almost necessary when we're talking about promoting inter interdisciplinarity and finding those high level connections between different disciplines and really allowing new disciplines to craft their own meanings on sort of abstract and complex concepts like resilience. I think, but it can also provide significant challenges later on when we are attempting to move from sort of conceptual research to more empirical research, the, the sort of opera, opera, operationalization of 
the concept within the new discipline. And I think that's where we find most archaeologists probably lying in this sort of second stage where we see the utility of the concept. We know that it's importance uh, for understanding change, but how exactly we apply it in archaeology uh, is still somewhat of a question. So in that sense, I think what we're really challenged with as archaeologists is maybe not so much defining what resilience is. We have definitions that we can use from ecology and psychology and other disciplines, but perhaps refining resilience within uh, archaeological research. And this sort of a process of this journey of refinement is something we've seen sort of archaeology uh, going through over the last uh, few years. Uh, in fact, one of the best examples of this is the uh, uh, special issue of Quaternion International, which was edited by uh, Sonia Grimm and Marcel Bratmoller and uh, Julian Real Salvatore, where they really attempted to refine the concept of resilience by sort of specifying and standardizing the use of perhaps the central analytical tool in resilience theory, at least uh, resilience theory as formulated in ecology, the adaptive cycle, which is this sort of very important analytical model for how we think about resilience and how we think about the stages of resilience. And while that was an attempt to sort of, uh, 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 sort of drill down into how the ecological view of resilience can be used in archaeology, this volume has a, uh, perhaps a decidedly different tone to it. Um, and I draw on um, uh, the comment from Sergio and Leah that overall we believe it is necessary for archaeologists to embrace a pluralist perspective within resilience research. While the adherence to the ecological theoretical framework with the use of the adaptive cycle metaphor is still important to describe adaptations, further steps must be taken to integrate human decision-making processes. And so really an understanding that, that the adaptive cycle and the ecological view of resilience has a place in archaeology, but it should not define resilience theory in archaeology. So we sort of have to uh, ask ourselves, well, what are the steps? How do we sort of refine resilience? Do we attempt to take uh, a more pluralistic perspective on what resilience might mean within archaeology? And that's something I tried to sort of keep in mind as I read through these particular chapters. And for me, at least, when I read articles that, that sort of touch on ideas of resilience or persistence or stability, sort of these related concepts, I, I always try to ask myself the question, who or what is resilient to what? So to what are our units of analysis and what are the disturbances that we want to, to sort of analyze? And how do we sort of pair our units of analysis with these disturbances? And so that was sort of the framework I worked from asking this question when looking at these different chapters. And broadly speaking, I sort of divided them into four different sort of um, uh, themes. A sort of more traditional view of resilience where we have people or populations sort of uh, uh, adapting to or responding to some sort of environmental disturbance or environmental change. And I'll sort of talk about these individually as I go and sort of the ways in which these chapters identify and use resilience. But we also see some more perhaps innovative uh, uh, applications of resilience theory, looking at something like the resilience of mobility strategies given the formation process we see and that we know are so important to how we interpret the archaeological record. We also see an example of sort of conceptual resilience, um, in, in this particular case uh, applied in ancient Egypt, and also sort of a social resilience or the resilience of cultural traditions to, in particular, hierarchical change. So um, I do want to sort of, before I sort of talk about each of these individually, I want to apologize ahead of time for uh, mispronunciation of any names. Uh, as someone with an odd last name as well, I certainly um, understand how that goes. Uh, I will do my best. Also, I want to apologize ahead of time for any mischaracterization of, of research um, of, of these really good chapters. Um, it's certainly not my intention to mischaracterize it. All right, so let's look at uh, sort of the first contribution uh, to, the, to the volume, uh, and that's by Foucault Shurjan. 
uh, in which we see um, uh, chapter title persistence in Neanderthal models. And here we view resilience uh, as a sort of outcome, as a sort of uh, end result or even the sort of emergent property of a number of interacting variables. In this particular case, this is seen as the sort of persistence of Neanderthal populations in, in certain spatial regions, uh, perhaps near uh, coastal areas, uh, given a number of different parameters that are sort of varied within an agent-based model. In this particular case, the model known as hominin space uh, sort of uses a combination of both reconstructing the environment and sort of changing sea levels and changing climate in combination with what I thought was a, a, a very nice use of parameters that we may not see very well uh, in terms of um, archaeological visibility, looking at things like birth rates and death rates and group size. Things that are very challenging for us to sort of identify archaeologically, but lend themselves to sort of seeing the variability in these parameters and how they interact with things like uh, population size or, or persistence uh, within, a, within a simulation framework. We see another example of an agent-based model by uh, Tabitha Kabora, where uh, the focus here it tends to be more on this sort of ecological sense of resilience. Here, looking at resilience not as sort of the persistence of certain populations, but more so as the persistence of particular activities, in this particular case, uh, agricultural activities. So in this way, it's almost a sort of human behavioral ecology model where we're looking at the trade-offs between whether uh, a group decides to sort of more prominently uh, engage in agricultural activities or sort of switch to alternative activities given a set of environmental perturbations. And so you see the sort of outline of the model here. But what I think is one of the real contributions here is, is a addition of a social aspect, sort of really balancing not just ecological systems, but a social ecological system. And in this case, using the idea of social cohesion and the sort of sense of um, almost um, uh, conformity within the uh, community and showing exactly how much of an influence that possibly plays in whether or not groups transition um, from one uh, subsistence activity to another. We see here in another sort of example of uh, environmental change or, or populations adapting to environmental change, a sort of multi-proxy approach taken by Christian Jorgensen in his creation of a sort of modified model that's more applicable to archaeology. So using here the urban resilience model, which, is, which uh, was sort of one of the uh, influential models early on developed by the Resilience Alliance, and really adapting that or maybe translating that is a better word for what that might mean in an archaeological example. Sort of talking about sort of the infrastructure and, and housing and going through that detailed work of model building in finding exactly what those um, uh, correlates might be. What are we going to look for in the archaeological record that would give us some indication of these, these sort of large domains, whether it be aqueducts or uh, reservoirs or civic in institutions. And this sort of model building process, I think, is a really important part of the sort of, uh, the, of resilience and applying resilience uh, to the archaeological context in a responsible uh, way. Um, the contribution by Carolyn Heights and colleagues pre uh, presents another example of the sort of people uh, being resilient to environmental change, and once again using a, a very multi-proxy approach. I think what we see in this chapter is a different conceptualization of what the goal is in terms of uh, resilience, not necessarily viewing resilience as an outcome or once again as sort of an emergent property of interactions and of, and of the systems, but rather as something embedded within it. Uh, resilience as a sort of set of capacities that are grounded in these social practices and that really see in the sort of repeated uh, engagement with particular strategies that, that uh, uh, were um, instituted. In this particular case, we see this applied to Alpine Neolithic communities. And I think that I, I wholeheartedly agree with this sort of notion of trying to identify sort of resilience as a sort of adaptive capacity in these sense. I think, but what we, what we need to sort of be cognizant about is the sort of amount of data required to look at this is it, sort of uh, quite a bit more. 
and that really having sort of high resolution spatial and temporal data is necessary to, to get to this place. It is, a, it is a definitely a goal and a, uh, a sort of what we should think about in terms of how we view resilience. Um, but this does require sort of extra degree of difficulty. In this particular case, these authors do it very well in terms of bringing together multiple lines of evidence and really being able to triangulate these different sources of evidence to give a sense of these sort of repeated strategies and repeated uh, practices that communities used in order to cope with climate-induced changes, in this particular case, uh, lake level changes and the settlement and resettlement of communities. I think we also see a very innovative approach presented by Benjamin Davies and colleagues, uh, where in this case, the, the focus is primarily on the sort of uh, mobility strategies that they identify and trying to get at that really fundamental question on whether or not what we even see in the archeological record is perhaps uh, representative of resilience strategies. And so here resilience is sort of viewed as the sort of visibility of mobility strategies given these formation processes. Once again, using a sort of agent-based model in which they sort of identify the boundaries of, of what uh, mobility strategies might look like. And then very cleverly associate that with uh, the cortex ratio or the sort of notion of how stone tools are displaced across the landscape. In the final two chapters, we see an extension away from the sort of traditional ecological view of resilience and a, a more of a metaphorical use of the concept and applied to different contexts. Here, Alexander Laktianov looks at resilience really as, the, as a sort of the long durée, the sort of long-term vision that uh, resilience theory provides particularly of a concept here, um, Setgem, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, um, which is this sort of notion of hearing a court case. And looking at this word, not only the word, but the context of the word within written texts um, through different periods of, of uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian history, moving from the Old Kingdom, the First Intermediate Period, Middle Kingdom, Second Intermediate Period to the, to the New Kingdom. So quite a, a large stretch um, of a significant institutional change and, and further identifying that what we see is, is, is the association with this word uh, towards elites early on in the old kingdom and a sort of almost democratization or movement out in sort of more regional um, uh, administrative centers later on in, in the new kingdom. And finally then we see uh, the a social cohesion concept come back again um, with this chapter by Agata Calabresi, where here we see resilience as the sort of persistence, once again, of social practices, in this case, after the death of elite individuals, and perhaps even a commentary on the resilience of the sort of hierarchy after key individuals pass away. Here, this is modeled by uh, GIS and the uh, sort of archaeoacoustic approach, looking at how uh, perhaps the death rituals associated with um, certain individuals may have been perceived and may have, of course, been heard across uh, the landscape. So I want to echo um, Sergio's comments earlier on in the introduction about sort of the, the notion of diversity and really diversity of approaches that we see within uh, resilience research in archaeology. And I think this volume is a really great example of the different ways that resilience can be not only applied, but also sort of uh, uh, molded in different archaeological contexts. And so I think, you know, taking from uh, Sergio's comments, I think the goal here, at least in, in, in this volume, was to sort of, you know, maybe demonstrate a path to a sort of more pluralist approach to resilience as opposed to simply the, the notions of uh, resilience that uh, derive from ecological theory. So how do we go about doing that? This is not a question I can answer, but um, I can at least draw from this particular volume in order to suggest what the next steps might be based upon um, these particular chapters. If we once again draw from Sergio and Leah's introduction, we see a, a strong, uh, uh, argument for not viewing resilience as a singular concept and which has a singular definition, but rather to view it more as a concept system. 
This is a term that I was not familiar with uh, until reading this. But from what I gather, this is sort of acknowledging the fluidity of the concept, acknowledging sort of the, uh, the dynamic definitions of the concept, and that it will have many different properties. Sometimes they will be more uh, identifiable in general theory. Sometimes they'll be more uh, specifically uh, disciplinary features. But that's something that's OK. We, we can sort of embrace that fluidity. I think for, for me, what that really signals is that within a sort of fluid concept system where we try to embrace the sort of many different versions of resilience and its related uh, uh, topics, persistence, stability, vulnerability, uh, many of the concepts that we sort of associate within the same uh, uh, sort of realm, I, I think this approach really highlights the importance of a, perhaps a more inductive bottom-up approach. And this is something that's very uh, uh, forcefully sort of acknowledged by Carolyn Heights in their chapter, where, and I'm paraphrasing this here, where they suggest that a top-down application of deductive models, such as those deriving from ecology, risk assuming resilience and the adaptive cycle first, and then fitting archaeological data within those assumptions. And, and you could argue that there may have been, um, this could be a critique of earlier uh, resilience research in archaeology, um, and that really we should reorientate to sort of producing uh, sort of more bottom-up model building approaches. And at least for me, I think one of the highlights of this particular volume was this uh, model building was seen in many of the, the chapters. I was a bit, um, uh, surprised when reading these that there wasn't a, a single uh, sort of use of the adaptive cycle in its sort of traditional ecological sense within these uh, uh, within these chapters. There was never really substantial talk about reorganization and our K phase versus R phase or omega phase. That was largely absent of these discussions. Rather, the sort of broad metaphor of resilience was used. Uh, but instead, that was sort of taken at a, a sort of baseline level with the models built up in each archaeological context. And I think this is really sort of important for us to acknowledge it because this really helps to sharpen sort of how we think about variables and really our inferences of the archaeological record or the absence of the archaeological record, as sort of uh, Buckle Shurjan identifies in, in that chapter. One of the other final points I want to make then is that the sort of agent based simulation models have. A, a lot of potential utility within uh, resilience research and uh, even a more sort of pluralist resilience uh, framework because we have the additional feature of, of sort of identifying the boundaries of decision-making processes. And we see that implemented here in a number of creative ways, both in this sort of notion of social cohesion and what it means uh, for resilience, as well as this sort of importance of mobility strategies as, as one of the primary strategies used to, to uh, uh, create resilience in, in order to sort of practice resilience. So I know this has been a sort of fairly abstract notions of, of resilience throughout this, this uh, sort of introduction to the volume. So I want to sort of wrap up and, and give a sort of maybe a, a, almost a, a slogan to uh, what the next steps might be. And at least for me, in, in my opinion, I think we need to sort of embrace the metaphor where we're perfectly fine with sort of identifying this sort of broad sense of what resilience is and what resilience can mean and really the multiple definitions of resilience. But I think it is really up to us to still do that hard work of building the model from the ground up. We can, we can both embrace the, the metaphor and still build the model and sort of meet in the middle. And, and that is what will probably produce the most effective and the most relevant research um, on resilience within archaeology. So with that, I would just like to once again say a very special thanks to Sergio and Leah. They've done a really outstanding job in, in shepherding this through. And of course, all the authors, I, I very much enjoyed reading your contributions. And then of course, the contributions um, of the McDonald and the University of Cambridge. So, thanks. Thank you, Eric. Um, there was an amazing uh, discussion about our volume. And thank you for pulling out um, topics and themes that are important within resilience um, studies. Um, I might have a couple of questions, but we will keep them uh, for later. So the Q&A session will be later. Um, and I think your slogan at the end, embrace the metaphor, build up the model, uh, fits well with our perspectives, my, mine and Leah's 
about how we think um, resilience and a pluralist uh, perspective on, on resilience. So thank you again. Um, and now we're gonna move on um, and we would like to welcome our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Charles Redman. Uh, Chuck is a Virginia Ullman Professor of Natural History and Environment in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences as well as the founding director of the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. His interests include human impacts on the environment, sustainable landscapes, rapidly urbanizing regions, urban ecology, environmental education, and public outreach, and has written numerous contributions about resilience. In particular, um, his co-author paper published in 2003 uh, titled Resilience of Past Landscapes, Resilience Theory, Society, and the Long Durée, was the first to alight the potential of resilience theory in archaeology. And since then, um, Chuck has been an advocate of a pluralist uh, trans transdisciplinary perspective on resilience. And today we'll talk about something that we, it was not deeply um, analyzed in our volume, that it's resilience and sustainability lessons from and for archaeology. Um, so thank you again, Chuck, for agreeing to talk to us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Sergio. And thank you um, to Sergio, Leah, and Victoria for inviting me to um, speak today. And more than that, for giving me the freedom to talk about whatever I wanted to instead of having to take a really challenging task like Eric did of uh, trying to cast additional light on the um, manuscripts that are part of this volume, which um, as you'll find are much more nuanced and, and, and complex than, than the presentation I'm about to give you. Um, let, me, um, let me share my screen. Yeah, that's perfect. I think we're good. Yep. Okay. Um, what I would um, like to start with, and, and I might say a word that, that'll belong more into the discussion, the Q&A at the end. Um, I like the discussion that is in your introduction, Sergio and Leo, and also in Eric's commentary of the pluralistic nature of resilience. However, I'm, I have some trouble that is, I think that resilience is used in many useful and different ways by different disciplines and different individuals. What I want to sort of confront or complain about is trying to put those all together into one operational thought. That is, I see the different approaches to resilient being useful, but combining them is making a, a sort of inconsistent concept, a, what I call a flypaper model of resilience rather than a set of different resiliences. That is, resilience is all things to all people. And that, that sort of worries me a little bit. So let me get on from this. Uh, well, this isn't taking me forward. I think I must have shared something that isn't mobile. Let's try a different shared. Much better, now I feel better. What would I like to accomplish today? Um, not surprisingly, I believe that archeology span can contribute to contemporary perspectives on society and on the resilience of society. Um, interestingly, and I'll try to 
argue it today, resilient perspectives on contemporary society can enrich the way we think about archaeology as well as archaeology can provide us new insights into how we deal with contemporary society. So I want to see this interaction that we heard a little bit of from Eric about. Um, interdisciplinarity underlies a lot of this. Um, I want to touch on both resilience and how it relates a little bit to sustainability and I perceive a difference in the two why sometimes they are conflated or used as a string as a resilient sustainable society and so forth um, uh, I'll give you what I think are some of the sort of conceptual interventions uh, that could lead to resilience building that we are confronting when we talk about archaeological interpretation uh, and I'll end with something that I think is important today but a little bit unrelated and that is some thoughts on gender roles within science and archaeology. My interests uh, in archaeology and in contemporary society have to do with the origin growth and development of urbanism and uh, my largest individual research grant recently was on building urban resilience to extreme weather related events. Uh, in other words, looking at extreme weather as the harbinger of climate change and how can we build cities to be more resilient both in the past and in the present. Um, clearly, uh, ur ancient urbanism was a solution to some of the challenges facing society uh, and one could argue that it laid the foundation for a, a long and resilient history of the world and so forth. We could similarly argue that modern urban society is a response as well to the challenges we face uh, and Clearly, cities have become the centers for commerce and creativity. They are where most of the economic growth in the world focuses and so forth. However, and this is an underlying theme of my entire talk today, resilience solution, resilient solutions to challenges provide us with important positive results. However, at the same time, they seem to have a series of un, hopefully unintended negative results. So although cities are the economic engines of the contemporary world, and I'm being conservative here, a quarter to a third of all urban households in the developing world live in poverty. That figure is probably great closer to half than a third. In other words, cities are the centers of economy, wealth, and and economic dynamism, but they also are the center of poverty uh, and unequal opportunity and, and so forth. Well, what can we do? Uh, I think we're being given an opportunity today in the contemporary world uh, to impact this. And part of that unique opportunity is cities are growing and continue to grow rapidly, largely through rural to urban migration, but also through internal growth. And this means that we are in a position to continue designing our cities. And in a way, it's a metaphor that can also be seen in archaeological growth of cities and endurance of cities over time. And so I think there is a important connection there. And I think there's an important connection in, in uh, climate change as well, because uh, perhaps the largest challenge we face today is what will be the impacts of climate change going forward. And we will witness and are witnessing early impacts of these largely in cities because of the density of cities and the investment in infrastructure in cities and the location of cities off, often on, on coastal areas and things like that. Okay, what are we trying to actually get accomplished today? And um, we can look at archaeology and say it allows us to better understand the past and that is a, an insight into the human condition and into society in general and I'm all for that. But I also want to focus and I believe that's where the interest in resilience as part of archaeology began on thinking of how we can use 
these insights to improve the way we think about problem solving in the past and how that helps us problem solve today. And so uh, I very much had a sort of career shift with most of my career and involvement in publications have been involved with archaeology and the origin of urbanism in the Middle East and, and, Mid and Mediterranean. But for the past 20 years, I've been really dealing with the contemporary situation and hoping to take things like I talk about today that derive from archaeology and put them into the service uh, of, of contemporary problem solving and hopefully making a better world. And they're, they're the obvious things that we all talk to each other about why archaeology is important. The countless situations we're able to investigate, the number of human nature, human governance, human uh, problem solving interactions. Uh, we are given the unusual opportunity of looking at processes of change and we not only see the change, but we can perhaps identify the warning signals that preceded the change, the triggers that instigated it, uh, the interventions that either made it better or worse. All of these things are hard to deal with contemporary challenges, but we are given at least the opportunity to deal with them in the past. Uh, and, and hence, I would argue that people trying to look at the science of decision making today based on only our ability to look at the contemporary situation are missing a great deal. Well, that all sounds pretty positive. Uh, I want to balance that positive attitude with the idea that the big challenges facing the world have been known for some time. And as far as I'm concerned, they don't seem to be solved, whether or not we use resilience. Uh, climate change is it's millennia old, but in its current version is 50 or 60 years old. Uh, the strength of the poverty trap, once again, has its history and prehistory probably, but certainly is very evident in contemporary society, social injustice, income inequality, the prevalence of war and violence, autocratic government. These are pervasive universal challenges and problems. Uh, and I would argue each of them demonstrates incredible resilience. Uh, and at the same time demonstrates that things that are resilient may not be desirable. Uh, I think this is too often forgotten and resilience is seen as a positive trait, which it can be in terms of uh, if you're happy with the condition you're in, but if you're unhappy, if you are the poor, and you find yourself trapped in this situation, you'll say that kind of resilience is something I want to undermine and, and reduce rather than reinforce. And, and this brings me to what probably is the underlying theme of what I'm talking about today. And that is uh, we've gotten to where we are with these challenges being recognized, but certainly unsolved uh, because the very people that we've, produced ourselves uh, from universities and the leaders, both of society and of scholars who lead the intellectual pursuits, uh, somehow have not been able to solve these problems despite the, the positive attitude and the emergence of, of interesting conceptual models. That the traditional framing of inquiry is leading us to a continuation of traditional knowledge and traditional approaches. And so my point is we need a <laughs> radical reframing of issues and in inquiry. Uh, perhaps pieces of that not, are a convergent interdisciplinary approach. And the, in, the involvement or centrality of values and and civic engagement is fundamental to scientific research. I think these are two important points to look at in terms of reframing things. But what you'll see is I'm a little bit worried about a focus, and I'm partly to blame for this on resilience, leading to a transformation in the kind of knowledge and inquiry that we really need. So what do we've got? We've got the, this promise of interdisciplinarity and we heard about it uh, from some of the manuscripts and we all think about it in our own studies and discussions of archeology span and the like. Um, 
it's important. Multiple lines of evidence, ramifying perspective, novel ideas, you know, all of these things are important. What I'd add to the normal litany of why interdisciplinarity is outside, people outside the academic field, uh, people in practice, uh, stakeholders, um, uh, decision makers in broader societies, uh, they like the idea of breaking down silos of, of interdisciplinarity. So it does get a lot of support. Having said all of those important things that I think are true, I can document in my own 50 years uh, since I was a graduate student that we were talking about interdisciplinary. We were in the field in Turkey. I re can remember the episodes of people from different disciplines talking about working together and the challenge of it at the time. Here we are 50 years later, still talking about it uh, with some notable achievements, but some notable frustrations at the same time. Um, my own direction or conceptual direction to sort of an interdisciplinary uh, conceptual models of understanding past and present society uh, has usually relied on social ecological systems, SES, as, as are mentioned in a number of the volumes manuscripts. Uh, this is what I've written about most. This is the sort of ecological origin of resilience theory and the resilience alliance is based strongly on it. Uh, after using and writing about it and speaking about it for many years, I woke up about seven or eight years ago and, and, and said to myself, this intellectually makes sense, but it's not very compelling to the broader world. The mayors and city managers and designers that I end up talking to about lessons from the past or even our studies of the contemporary situation is not so compelling. When they want to make decisions, they call designers into the room. They call engineers, urban planners, architects. Um, we need to in, engage that additional section of society. And, and what I've done is I've added to the red and yellow SES, -a, the blue technological infrastructural domain. And this is, uh, this is where people are. This is where the money is spent. This is where the big decisions are about new roads and buildings and layouts of cities and institutions that run them and regulations for those institutions. And if there's anything to add to un better understanding of contemporary society based on archaeology, it would be the technological infrastructural domain. We have the evidence of this perhaps better than the other two domains. And so it's a conceptual realignment that I think is, is, is particularly sympathetic to the archaeological world. But why is it difficult to work? Why is interdisciplinarity in general such a challenge and adding to it more dimensions makes it even more a challenge? Uh, part of that is we define our each of our training and disciplines in different ways where we have different kind of vocabulary and communication. The objectives of research are different. Uh, the methods that is what is acceptable proof and what is relevant data and appropriate methods for in investigating that information. Uh, these things look very different. I've worked for 20 odd years with, particularly with ecologists uh, and we get along great and we're interested in generally the same thing, but we really look at the world differently. We really measure it in different ways. and. Uh, and I would argue that each of us has a sort of distinct logic. And until we can align those logics in a way that they re reinforce each other rather than they conflict with each other, uh, interdisciplinarity will be a, a, a dream rather than a reality. Well, what are some of the steps to moving forward to establishing this intellectual alignment, which is what I think we need? Um, the easy step for interdisciplinary is to act in the service of each other. That is, uh, ecologists may talk to us about ecosystems, measures, biodiversity, uh, uh, 
biogeochemical flows, things like that. We may talk as a social scientist about people and institutions and agency and things like that and lead sort of to enrich some of the things they talk about. They give us sort of the green angle on some of the things we're interested in. Um, it's useful, these insights, but what I want us to do is that the insights must be in perspectives that not just the service of new information. This is where the rich people live. This is where the poor people lived. And that tells us their relationship to the environment is different if you're rich and poor. That's useful and interesting. But what I want us to say is what is their logic of knowledge? And does that lead to a new way of thinking about my logic of knowledge? And do the implications for each of our perspectives ramify to make our own way of thinking richer? That's what I hope. Well, let's get more specific about this and let's talk about the sort of bread and butter of resilience and that is adaptation and transformation. Um, adaptation and we can get lots of definitions for it, but it's actions undertaken to maintain the capacity to deal with current or future predicted changes. In other words, when we adapt, uh, we're trying to sort of build on and return to the conditions that we have appreciated and defined in the past as existing. Uh, it's a pretty conservative approach and that's my point. We'll get to this in greater detail. Transformation on the other hand is something you're seeking to do when you recognize the system just doesn't work and so you don't want to face a crisis and return to this old system because the old system is vulnerable to this crisis or has undesirable characteristics. So when facing a challenge, you want to move the society forward to have it grow into a newer, fundamentally different system because the old system is either undesirable or untenable. Well, so let's look at the difference between adaptation and transformation. And, and the reason I'm focusing on this is I'm, I'm arguing, if you can't tell, that resilience theory, particularly from the ecological perspective, is built on the idea that adaptive capacity or the capacity to face change and return to similar systems is at the heart of what we're looking at. And I want to argue that we need to step beyond that, not just look at it that way, but look at it more radically. So here you can see some of the uh, either ors that I've lined up between adaptation and transformation, incremental change versus major change, response to shock, action in anticipation of shock, maintain the previous order or create a new order, or at least lead to an open-ended system where it will evolve. Uh, adaptive capacity is a tremendous resource that, that, I, that I, I'm for. I'm not against re resilience, but adaptive capacity in a sense of returning to an old order is, is dangerous to me. Adaptive capacity in allowing you to build the new order to reorder system dynamics I see is quite, quite exciting. Um, and transformation involves building individual leadership agency, training change agents and things like that. In a purest sense, the way that I first learned about resilience theory from the Resilience Alliance meetings is resilience had emergent properties that came from the system and the way the system was encoded this capacity. That didn't mean that we knew where we were going as we went there. And that I think is an important element. Now, I'm making the point that transformation is what we need, something more radical than adaptation. But I have to point out right away that transformation is hard and it's hard to get people on board to it. I think it's fundamental address to addressing the major challenges facing society. But because the outcomes and implications are uncertain when you embark on a transformation, it is risky and people view it of people, particularly in positions of power are hesitant to risk their position and the advantages they already enjoy with a new system that may come out different. Uh, and 
people who benefit are usually the people who are making most of these societal decisions. And they are going to be hesitant to get fully in board for radical transformations. Um, where some of this overlaps is when we talk about resilience as a reaction to stresses or shocks that the system's occurring. Well, I would also argue that those same shocks are an opportunity to move back to where you were before, or they are an opportunity to transform the society in important and fundamental ways. So these same shocks may be really a, a, a real opportunity. Here, I'll give you a definition for resilience. And it's not a surprising one. It's the capacity to prepare for disruptions, to recover from these, uh, and to adapt to them. The, the phrase that this definition is different from the Resilience Alliance is it embeds the idea of growing from these disruptive experiences into new forms. And this comes not surprisingly, not from archeologists, but from people who are based on improving uh, the economic plight of people over the world. And so they see building resilience, not only as an ability to cope with disruption, but to emerge from it better off than you were before. And uh, I think that's great, but I'm not sure how easy it is to actually operational. I, I see these as somehow conflicting, this idea of adaptation and transformation being married together into one definition I find very hard. Here's where I'm going to bring sustainability into the picture, because I think resilience is a process and adaptive capacity is a, is a resource to, to make good decisions and to deal with the changing world. Um, but I think it leaves open the idea that we could end up with a fascist government, we could end up with social inequality, um, because the outcomes are not predetermined in an emergent process like that. Contrary to that, I think sustainability is concerned with process, but it's more concerned with outcomes. And, and I take a um, set of definitions that from a, another British institution from, at Essex called the Step Center. And it takes the three very similar things that we see in lots of diagrams uh, where it's economy, ecology, and society. But I want to take their spin on those three sort of orbits. And, and it is economy, not just growing gross domestic product, but human well-being is enhanced. Um, ecology is not just preserving biodiversity, but it's maintaining or enhancing the integrity of ecological systems, the underlying ways that, that the world systems work. Uh, need to be protected and maintained. And part of that may be maintaining biodiversity, but it involves a lot more other things in terms of life cycle, in terms of waste production, in terms of climate change and so forth. And a tough one that I think is often not part of the in internal definitions of, of both resilience and sustainability is I think systems that don't move towards social justice and social equity are not systems we want to pursue, whether it's the dynamics or the outcomes that we are engaged with. So if we're doing this and we think transformations are needed and that we need to really move in a radical direction, but they're difficult to convince people of, is there a sort of middle ground? And I want to introduce the word transition because it's a it's a management strategy that many people in sustainability have picked up on. And the big difference here is, is transition in the dic dictionary definition is moving from one known state to another predicted or known state. The key distinction between transition and transformation is the outcome of the transition is known, or at least it's defined in advance. Um, that's a limitation, but it's also an ability to get more people on board and moving for this. It assumes that we somehow can understand where we want to go. Resilience as a process leads us in what we hope are positive directions, but we're not sure of the real total outcomes. How do we balance these two? I think transition management is some of the important things uh, 
uh, here are some in issues, and I think I should move a little more quickly or we won't get to the end, but a lot of this is culturally contingent that we dealing with geography, ge dealing with the development of institutions over times and all of these, how they are both responses to contemporary challenges, but often lead us to unintended traps uh, or, or situations that we don't want to be in. Uh, here are what I would say, and in, in, in I believe in my studies of ancient urbanism, these there are sort of four strategies for building resilience that I think were practiced in antiquity and also are totally relevant to today. And the important thing about each of these, and I'll spin through them, is that they confer important advantages at the time, but they probably, and I would argue they do, also introduce serious vulnerabilities and perhaps even unfortunate consequences directly. And so we have to begin to look at um, employing these strategies, but employing them in a way where we are sort of not locking ourselves into a, a undesirable situation. So the first of these interventions is mobility, and one of the chapters in the volume directly addresses mobility. Um, and mobility was clearly essential in antiquity and in, in the archaeological record. Uh, but mobility remains one of the chief interventions and challenges to employ um, the global economy as mobility of goods, the immigrant refugee problem is mobility of people, uh, the mobility toward opportunity as well as away from harm. All of these things are, are immediately in dominating contemporary society and what can we look from the past. Um, ecosystem management, green infrastructure, uh, fundamental to some of the major processes, the origin of agriculture and, and for cities in my own thinking are, are predicated on the ability of people to work with ecosystems in ways that make them more productive in terms of human definition. A lot of that management involves the introduction of infrastructure. And I think in the past we can see this, origin of cities in the Middle East and the redesign of hydrology to serve human purposes, um, leveraging our capacity to produce through through uh, domestication and agriculture. Um, the introduction of private property, the transformation of surplus goods into prestige items and facilities, all of these are part of the way infrastructure has led us to enable a more effective and complex society. This is a, a, a little bit different, um, but it's probably the most important of all, and that is over time how we've moved toward, I use a silly word, complexification of society. In a way, has complexification enhanced or inhibited resilience. I think we could argue both cases. It has allowed us to put more people together, to produce more goods, to specialize in the production, which allows for this complexification and interaction, to establish various governing orders, both sacred and secular, uh, to actually provide security through a monopoly of the use of force, which both provides security, but also provides the option for, for, for um, authoritarian rule and, and uh, social injustice. So what are some of these take a bit, takeaways? Uh, uh, these are a few that, that are sort of repeated in some of the articles in this volume in, in your own study. I mean, local sustainability is the balance between regeneration and extraction and how we operationalize that's going to lead to at what level our social equity is engaged in. One of my favorite themes is decision-making today, and I believe in the past is driven by short-term maximization without adequate concern for long-term consequences. We as archeologists love those long-term things, but the problem in talking to people today is if you say, well, take the long-term into consideration, they'll just respond, we can't get to the long-term and 
without making all these short-term decisions. And so we need the way to work these two scales together. Uh, the other conundrum I often see, and, and I believe archaeology gives us insight to, though not an answer to, and that is the choice between maintaining flexibility uh, versus over-specialization. And today we're moving into an over-specialized world. The various positive discussions of the introduction of smart cities and the use of the word smart cities being resilient worries the heck out of me because smart cities are over-specialized, they're over-controlled, they introduce real-time monitoring of flows of people and goods and energy, and then developing algorithms that we think are the better way to do that, but do they lock us into unintended consequences and rigidity against change and things like that? Um, and a slightly subtler one, and one that Jared Diamond has emphasized before, is um, in the face of change, what values and normative ideas are so important we can't allow them to change? And what are those values and normative ideas uh, are okay to change and still to involve? How do we rethink of um, our conceptual models. These are some of the sort of contemporary issues that we're involved with in talking about society today, but also in talking about society in the distant past. And that cover of a book from about 10 years ago uh, started out being a discussion of different ecological areas uh, that, that this group of people were studying. But in each of the cases, their contemporary situation required the, the articles to go into their distant past and how their past led to the context of these uh, contemporary situations. Well, this is the sort of final thought I want to leave you with, and it's a little bit different from some of the others, but I think it's part of the same puzzle of how do we move forward in science? How do we move into a science we're comfortable with, yet is radical and transformatory enough that will allow us to solve the problems that, quite frankly, generations of smart people just like us have been unable to solve? And Part of, I think, part of that problem is we do not take full advantage of the resources and their potential that we're presented with. And some of those resources are underutilized or, or people who are not given sufficient opportunities to contribute. And uh, of particular interest in obvious to, in archaeology are, are sort of gender norms that allow many females at the table, and I wouldn't doubt that over half the people listening today are females. Um, but if we begin to look at the, um, the, the endowed chairs and we look at the people making decisions on journals, uh, this is um, this is the gatekeepers of society seem to remain uh, gender specific and largely primarily male. And we've made progress in this area, but a lot more could be done. I mean, uh, systemic change in this area and the entire what we call jetty justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, has to take on a new dimension in thinking about how we conduct science and not just, well, it's the right thing to do, which it is, but that science will benefit because of that. And why do I think that? Well, I think that we can, by being more inclusive, by sharing authority, by listening harder, and listening is the big issue, uh, spending time working together, yes, but listening to each other and acknowledging the value of the other perspective. Uh, to not confuse working together with just meaning we're providing each other with technical support that I know about plants and you know about animals and we'll work together, but saying that we have different ways of looking at how the world works. And that doesn't mean to work together means you need to lower your standard, you need to raise your vision and that has to do with these conceptual models and how we uh, can involve. And perhaps the most important thing about an engagement and, and inclusion is that people of other gender or other ethnic backgrounds and whatever need to be invited into the process early. That 
that it isn't enough that once we know what we're doing, we start talking about uh, local involvement and engagement. That as we develop our concepts, as we define our problems, as we define our approach to those problems, we need to allow people of all persuasions to take a leadership role. And I can document in my final word is in my own career, uh, much of my greatest success is really not related to my own achievements, but to the kind of um, contributions that were made by my closest colleagues who happened by coincidence to be female uh, and of sort of greater abilities in so many areas that I wouldn't have been able to realize on my own. And so I wanna leave you with the thought that um, we should be thinking not just of conceptual scientific models, but also of social models of engagement in designing our projects. Once again, thank you all for inviting me and I hope um, we have some time and thoughts to talk about going forward. Awesome. Thank you so much for that talk. I It was amazing and I'm sure everyone appreciates it. Um, and thank you as well to Eric for the wonderful talk. And we hope that this has piqued all of your interest who are watching in purchasing the volume. Um, and we are going to put the pre-order form in the chat as usual. And then we want to thank you all for coming and particularly because your support means the world to us. And it's amazing to know that so many people support early career archaeologists, particularly, especially during these uncertain times in the UK. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to come out and um, support us. Um, we're now going to open up the floor to questions. Please do raise your hand by using the button at the bottom of the screen, and then we'll call on you to you may ask questions. We prefer you to write it in the chat, and we'll be keeping an eye on that, and Vicki will be reading out those questions. Uh, Sergio, do you want to start? Well, I'm going to start, so to break the ice. Um, it's a question to both Chuck and Eric, and um, it's about the the, the, the distinction uh, between past and future and how archaeologists can study the past to shed some light on future strategies. Um, and this is a well-known um, kind of recent challenge in resilience studies about descriptive and normative um, uh, perspectives. So, Chuck, how do you think we can, as archaeologists studying the past, define some strategies for the future. Do we risk to misapplicate um, and, and to create some misapplication of uh, analogies and comparisons since the context in the past were different from the context we have now? And to Herrick, it is because, like, I know he published um, a paper in an edited book about resilience and how we can look forward by looking back. So that's my first question, yeah. That of course um, is, is not just a question. I mean, that is a career you're asking for. You're asking for an entire reduction and in, in how we do things. But let me let me give you a couple of reactions. I, I don't think it'll answer you satisfactorily, but may get us going in some directions. Um, I think there is a sort of phenomenological potential to archeology. span And by that, what I mean is the current world has an immediate and distant past. And so one of the things, and it's on one of the slides, if we're trying to understand the present, we need the things that led us to where we are. I mean, why are the institutions we have structured the way they are? Why is the infrastructure, the built environment around us the way that it is and so forth? And we need to look to the recent and more distant past 
to look for trends and solutions and answers to the question of why are things the way they are. And some of that may involve history or record keeping and some may involve actually into the archaeological record. I think these are important because, as I also mentioned, my my opinion, some of the greatest challenges to achieving things like social justice and, and getting rid of poverty and so forth, we have to break down resilience of these kind of cycles. And to do that, maybe we need to look to the past and see how did the, were they introduced in reaction to what and what kinds of interventions could overcome them. So I think there is a direct answer of understanding the world today and how we could work with that world today in a way that may improve things. The other subtler one is the, well, to say something simple, to sort of use archaeology to improve the way we understand how the world actually works. And, and that, whether you want to call it problem solving or decision making or, or some of the things that I mentioned that decisions that have to be made in terms of norms and values and, and persistence and change and things like that. Uh, archaeology gives you lots of examples. I have to say I'm a great fan of the adaptive cycle. And the frustration in that is I joined the Resilience Alliance in 2002. And I love the adaptive cycle as an archaeologist, uh, giving me a, a sort of metaphor for things that I saw in the record to better understand them. At the very same time, the people in Stockholm were getting bored with the adaptive cycle. They don't use it anymore. They didn't use it starting when I started to use it. You know, they started not to use it anymore. But the kind of thing that that gave me is it gave me a a interpretive model that allowed me to say uh, Gibbons' rise and fall of the Roman Empire isn't the only model that society operates under. Many societies fall when we think they're doing the great things. And the sort of K phase of investing energy and resources and maintaining an ever-increasingly complex and vulnerable societal structure is, wow, interesting when I begin to look at things and begin to look at when did this happen and under what conditions. And the other part of the cycle that phenomenologically, I'm not going to find the past and the present, but sort of structurally and conceptually, I think we find is in the reorganization phase of the cycle. That is, if you think that society falls and then it's replaced right away by the, by the next society, which is a very historic sort of Ibn Khaldun kept telling us these things were happening in, in, in the medieval Mediterranean, but, um, but the adaptive cycle says there's a period of reorganization in which competing interests are vying with each other. Well, that's wow. And, and, and I can think of examples in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia and the like. And I say, wow, that is an interesting way to look at collapse and redistribution, that it's a period of competition where the outcome is not certain. When society fell, you didn't know how it would reemerge. And that says, where do we need to focus our energy today in developing a new society and so forth? Those are, those are thoughts on your question. They're not an answer to your question. Yeah, and I can maybe pick up a little bit where, where Chuck left off there and, and this sort of question of how do we use the archeological record to be relevant? Um, and, and so Sergio, your comment about the, uh, a recent volume looking, for, uh, looking back, going forward by looking back uh, which is actually reviewed in this uh, particular Ar Archaeological Review of Cambridge in the book review section. And this was a specific attempt by the editors Felix Reedy and Payson Sheets to um, get the authors to really think about what the policy implications of our work is. And I think that's an important first step. And it, it's, it's not as easy as you might think in terms of putting it in um, a, a framing that is relevant. I think Chuck's point that a lot of policymakers are interested in outcomes and making those decisions on, those, on, on what the outcomes might be. And I think it's finding that the, those sort of outcomes and really then what archaeology provides us is narratives, which can hopefully be sort of integrated into the narratives we have in our everyday lives. That's, that's the sort of uh, uh, point of, of commonality in that. 
And finding what that narrative is and constructing that narrative is a challenge at, at times, especially when the work can be very sort of idiosyncratic and very localized. Uh, pushing that out is an important, is an important um, uh, sort of pro process that we do. Now, we, I don't think archaeology can sort of comment on every sort of um, issue that we have in modern society, and, and nor should we try. So and I think in some ways we need to pick our battles and find out where we can actually produce sort of a narrative that very much resonates. And I think this is what you see in idea uh, of sort of popular books. Chuck mentioned Jared Diamond, the, the idea of collapse clearly resonated with many sort of, uh, of the public and policymakers around. Now, do we need to always construct concepts of collapse? No, but we can sort of give a deeper richness to what that collapse might look like, collapse of the Roman Empire, collapse of other areas. We can provide those sort of other alternative narratives to, to sort of identify that, that it doesn't always happen in the same way um, and that there is differences and that we should be cognizant of those differences. Any, Thank any you both. Yeah, any immediate questions? Anybody have a hand raise? Otherwise, I can ask a more general one, which is, um, Chuck, I really appreciated uh, the like force of your statements about like including other groups of people in archaeology and incorporating those in. And um, I think it speaks to something that we all tend to talk about in archaeology but we don't tend to deal with much which is like being active um being an, an activist and an archaeologist and i just wondered what your thoughts are on like how do we encourage people with particularly like as younger people or people newer in the field how do we encourage people within our own departments to embrace that stance because it is so incredibly important and would allow us to do some of like use archaeology for outlining resilience and working with policymakers. But yeah, how do we incorporate that easier and encourage people to adapt that? Well, I think there are a lot of good answers to that question. And, and I think there are a lot of people who are not only well intended, but trying to actually put into action engagement and openness and inclusiveness that we're talking about. Um, I think it's harder than having a good attitude. And I think that the sort of gatekeepers of the world, and I use that term generally to mean editors, advisors, chairs, directors, um, they're male dominated. And they got where they got, not just by being male, but also, and, and that doesn't mean they're not good people, but also by not being inclusive. And, you know, and their success, I mean, there is this output that people are successful often who are the most self-reliant and the most uh, restrictive in terms of openness. And I don't think it should have to be that way. And so given that, I don't think it's that we just need to discuss because the young people have this idea, but they aren't able to enact it because the gatekeepers of the world are from another era. And that includes me, I'm from another era. Um, and that, that happens. My own recommendation, and uh, I actually made it at a, at a, at a meeting pre-COVID and never could carry it further, is I actually think that we could take a radical step. And this is, Talks, is talking about gender now, and it could be talking about ethnicity or race or whatever we want as well. I think that the editors of journals today, the program officers of foundations today, and this could be Eric, I think he said, qualifies as that, should get together and make a pact that in the next 12 months, they will only accept articles and give grants where the primary author is a female or person of color, you can, and, and the immediate response is we couldn't do that. You know, it would 
dropped the quality of the world and, you know, we couldn't find enough people to. Now, isn't that a bad argument? Isn't that a not true argument? And couldn't it be just for 12 months? I don't want to say forever, but why couldn't? And then in those 12 months, you would find the quality of the articles would not drop and the grants would not be worse. And all of a sudden you would say, this could be a different world, but no one's going to, you know, people aren't ready to take that step. But I think those are the kind of steps we need to think about. You know, a, a radical transformation, there is a risk, but the reality is there there's greater potential than there is risk. Awesome, thank you. I can just make a comment that, that, that I think Leah in seminar series has attempted to do things like that. And, and you can do that in smaller steps and maybe just uh, sort of publications, but your own seminar series, you know, really uh, favor sort of research that comes from multiple perspectives and, and diverse perspectives. Great. Right. Any, does anybody else have any other questions? Well, I want to I want to put out a small challenge. I was in a um, Zoom webinar giving a talk to a, a, a large group of students in Canada, and um, I actually brought up the same gender thing at the end. And then people asked questions, and there were four, three questions, and then the the moderator was going to say, and we'll ask our last question, the fourth question. And they were all from males, and I said, well this is symptomatic of what I'm talking about. And I'm not going to take the fourth question from a male and then zero questions from females. Leah, you're defending your gender. Thank you for being there. But, you know, I would just say there, there is a tendency not to step out on the edge and not to ask questions in this context. And that's symptomatic of a bigger challenge that we need to overcome. Thank you. Yeah, I en entirely agree. Okay, Sergio, did you have any other thoughts to give before we? No, I think uh, it was great. Like, I don't have anything to add. And as Chuck said, I don't want to be the last to talk. Oh, <laughs> oh you not making me the last talk. Okay. <laughs> oh, but we do appreciate, if no one else has any questions, we do appreciate everyone coming and we would love if you could all pre-order a volume. Um, we thank the contributors and our speakers and um, yeah, we hope everybody has a wonderful, whatever time of day it is from wherever you are and yeah. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>